we don't need to be in communion with with Rome and and any of the Eastern churches to right now begin to convey to our people, you know, the wisdom, the grace of the undivided church and, and from which we get everything except, yeah. you know, like the specific words of the Book of Common Prayer, right? I mean, but but the idea of the Book of Common Prayer is, is, is ancient, you know, it comes out of the rule of St. Benedict and, and other monastic rules. And so we need to do our work. Yeah. We need to challenge our people a little bit. We need to say, you know, this, this is, we got to give them nutrition, a nutritional diet of the fathers and, and of, in my opinion, icons and, and asceticism and the Jesus prayer. I mean, and we can borrow from, from the Orthodox world for, for some of their teaching literature. We can borrow from the Roman world if, if there's anything there. Um, but just let's do our work. And I think the Holy Spirit and God will see this and then he will make the kind of um, reunification that he has in mind happen. Yeah. Right now, we're, we have this great riches uh, uh, available to us that are, that are mostly completely untapped. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Mere Catholicity podcast. I am your host, as always, Jonah Saller. And for those who are new here, if you're looking to support the podcast or find out more information or get to know me and the Mere Catholicity movement a little bit better, there is a link below to my locals page where you can join a community of like-minded Christians who are all striving together to enter into a deeper Catholicity, to, to live out the Catholic faith more authentically in community with one another. So if that's of interest to you, please support the podcast by clicking the link below. Today, I am very happy to be joined by uh, a friend of mine, Father Matthew Dahlman. Um, I'm very grateful for his time, grateful that he's coming on to chat with me. Um, for those who are unaware and do not know Father Matthew, I'm going to give him just a moment uh, to introduce himself. So, Father Matthew, welcome. Thank you for coming on. Uh, please let the audience know a little bit about who you are, what you do, etc. Thank you, Jonah, for having me on. I am Father Matthew Dahlman. I'm an oblate of St. Benedict, St. John's uh, Benedictine Abbey in Collegeville, Minnesota. I am uh, the rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church, a parish in the Diocese of Central Florida. Been here for two years. Been a a rector, a parish priest for seven and a half years. I am also the founder of Akenside Institute for English Spirituality, a project of mine that's been going on for about 12 years. And I am married for going on 24 years and I have six children. And that's about my story. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, well, th thanks again for, for being willing to come on and, uh, have a conversation with me. I want to just help viewers to get to know you a little bit better before we kind of dive into a little bit more of the specifics of the conversation. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, could you just share a little bit of your story, your journey to uh, where you are today as a, as a priest? Yeah, I mean, it's always important. For me, I my my journey and and has i think taken on a real it, it really tells a lot about the views i have and and the way i understand and live the faith i grew up in wisconsin uh, near milwaukee and into and baptized into the lutheran tradition and, and grew up in the lutheran tradition mainly uh, growing up in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, baptized Missouri Synod, for those people who know about all that. Um, nominal, but I'd say, you know, regular, but nominal uh, for the most part. Uh, family went to church. I, I sang in the youth choir, got involved a little bit with youth ministry, not so much youth ministry, but the youth group. and. Anyway, um, 
like the like the big Bach organ flourishes at the end of most of the services. Uh, looking back, it was a liturgy that was somewhat influenced by the liturgical renewal movement of the 20th century. Um, anyway, I uh, went off to college, Washington University in St. Louis, which was a kind of finding myself type experience. Um, Anyway, once I went off to college, I was a I was a I was a jock as a kid. You know, it was just sports. Uh, I, re I barely read a book really until college, and uh, which is funny. And football was where I focused on, and I did play a little bit at the Division three level, which my university was at, but. It was mostly practicing and avoiding major injury. I was lucky to I was lucky to go through, gosh, what was it, eleven years of of tackle football without a major injury. I was mm. a quarterback for most of it. Anyway, after my junior, I, 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 once I got to Washington University, um, I stopped participating in the Christian faith. I didn't turn against the Christian faith. I didn't know a lot about the Christian faith, quite frankly, but anyway, it wasn't a, it wasn't a becoming something else. It was just reducing any, any active participation in it outside of when I went home for Christmas and Easter. I don't even know if it was Easter. After college, um, was going to be in the next, uh, major jam band. I was a music, I'd become a musician. I played guitarist and composed a lot of music and was going to follow in the footsteps of the Grateful Dead and, and fish with a PH and uh, went up to Minnesota. Twin Cities lived there for a while. On the way there, though, I met my wife and we got engaged right away. So we did go up and live in Minnesota, but um, the world famous touring rock musician in a, in a, in a jazz uh, context sort of thing. Um, became studying composition, jazz composition, big band composition, and, and Western classical composition, counterpoint, and things like that. And uh, eventually found my way into film scoring a little bit. Hmm. Um, uh, by the time my wife and I, we moved around a lot, six cities in seven years. Again, through Faithwise, through all of this, it was Christmas and Easter, and that's it. Um, whenever we went back home to Milwaukee. Um, anyway, um, once, uh, so my wife got pregnant and I had been kind of interested in, in Western philosophy and aspects of uh, Western psychology, particularly 20th century stuff um, that had led to studying or taking part in a um, great books adult education program in Chicago where we were living and did reread re some Bible and reread some other things. I'd long had an interest in Marshall McLuhan's writing and it all came to a head once uh, my, my first daughter was born and the miracle of it all brought me into the great mystery of, of life in the way that I was uh, uh, engaging in any way and reading that Marshall McLuhan became Christian or actually became Roman Catholic long before the medium was the message. Mortimer Adler, who was involved with the great books movement became, was baptized, I think right before he died. So I life, and this was around 2008 and the, and the economic collapse right before Obama became the president. So, um, decided to, or I just found myself in a valley in life. Uh, not in terms of my marriage or my being a father. These were great sources of joy for me, but everything else was kind of a mess. So I decided, um, undoubtedly beckoned by the Holy Spirit anonymously, to uh, give church a second try, which was about how I was thinking about it. Hmm. And um, so looked around a little bit, went back to Lutheran for a little while, experimented with, uh, Latin Mass, Roman Catholic in Chicago, St. John Cantius, for those of you who've heard of that place. 
and even tried Presbyterian. You you were Presbyterian, weren't you? At some point. Informally, but for for a time, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, anyway, the one I went to left me cold. Um, as did the Lutheran, and I like the Roman Catholic. Okay, but anyway, gave up after about two years of, of trying or a year or so. I don't know. Uh, more kids came along. And by the time that uh, my wife was pregnant with our fourth child, I had said to her, I guess I must be a functional atheist, which is a very nerdy thing to say. I was kind of nerdy. Maybe I still am, but not an atheist actually, but you know, in practice one, because I couldn't seem to find a Christian community that I, I resonated with. Then lo and behold, um, nearby where we lived in suburban Chicago by that time, we lived in Lyons and nearby in a, a, the municipality Riverside. I, my wife and I and, and, and children in strollers and, and, a, and one, the fourth one uh, in the oven, we were walking in our neighborhood or the, the neighborhood next to ours. And she, we looked at a church and she's, my, Hannah asked me, my wife asked me if I had um, ever checked out that place. And again, this is all Holy Spirit anonymously working as I look back. And I said, I looked at the, I looked at the church and I looked at the sign and I, and, and the words on the sign were St. Paul's Parish in big letters in smaller letters underneath Anglican dash Episcopal slash Benedictine. And I said to myself, and I said out loud, I should say to my wife, no, I haven't checked out that church, at, nor do I know what any of those words mean. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even know what St. Paul meant, so or Paul. That's a, that, mm. that, There's your, my Lutheran sort of experience anyway. So anyway, um, checked it out, and of course the Holy Spirit was anonymously working because I fell in love with the place without knowing anything of going on. Never even heard of the Episcopal Church before. So I didn't really choose the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church, God wanted me to go here. To this parish. This specific one. And three months or four months later, uh, when I, I went once, got on with the rector immediately. This guy, like, I, like I'd known him for 15 years. Um, I, there was incense. I didn't really know what that was outside of Nag Champa. Um, and then, uh, there was a sermon that was like less than half an hour, which was, I was shocked by, it was like eight minutes, um, very reverent, very holy. I felt, I felt something that I would look back on and say, uh, the, the holy presence of, of God, uh, quite, quite everywhere in this, in the liturgy, I wouldn't have used that term back then. And then anyway got on with the rector, talked with him for like half an hour after the mass, and then came back three months later, right after our fourth child was born, this time with my oldest, who was then four, came to the 10 o'clock. It was the same wonderful ex wordless experience for me. Mm -hmm. got, the rector remembered my name, even though it had been three or four months later. I don't know how, I know how he did that, but at the time it blew my doors off. And uh, my daughter enjoyed it. It was Christ the King, actually which hmm. we're about to have this Sunday, yeah. Christ the King 2009. And we came back the following um, Sunday. My daughter had been invited to join their Sunday school, which was called Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, but they didn't tell me that at the time. And uh, she, so it was, um, I often weep at this moment, so if I do, forgive me. Um, when, um, uh, when we got to the offertory of the mass, which I wouldn't have had that term at that time, of course, um, I noticed that something was taking longer than it normally does. The, the priest was standing there. And I, so I looked back and I saw my, my oldest daughter who was four at the time holding a, an adult woman's hand. I assumed it was her Sunday school teacher. It was. And she was holding something else in their hand. Turned out all the kids had made crowns for with an activity 
uh, for Christ the King. And so they, the church had a tradition where at the, at the offertory, the, the, te- the catechists would bring the, the kids forward. They would, there was a table set just to the side of the altar. They would put their crowns on the table uh, as part of the ritual, and then they would go back to, then the kids would go to their parents. Well, as I look back and saw my daughter holding that woman's hand, I absolutely wept. And she looked so, my daughter looked so uh, comfortable, happy, comfortable in her own skin. And that gave me permission to accept what I was doing, because by that time in my life, I was 35, so we're like 18 years after I'd stopped going to church. I no longer trusted my own instincts because my instincts had gotten me into all sorts of dead ends and, and, and bad situations in my life. Nothing criminal or anything, but, you know, just dead ends and like life. So I didn't trust my gut anymore. So I, I, as I saw Twyla, I, I, I was able to then say, you know what, what I'm feeling is right because I can see it in her. And um, anyway, after uh, we, we, the whole family started coming two Sundays later for the second Sunday of Advent that, that year. And uh, we haven't stopped coming ever since. Um, and two months after that, I was asking the priest for a meeting. I said, I think I'm called to the priesthood, which is an absolutely ridiculous thing for me to have said at that point, since I don't even know what priests mean, having not grown up with any priests. So God was active in all of this. Started a Roman Catholic seminary as, a, as an Anglican Episcopal, Episcopalian that fall, and then added a second master's degree program. Uh, so I, at Neshota House in a distance program, uh, that, so I did two concurrent master's programs at the same time, both Roman and wow. Anglican. And then uh, got two degrees out of that, I discovered Martin Thornton along the way and was ordained to the diaconate and the priesthood in 2016. First cure was in central Illinois in the, in the Diocese of Springfield. And then came down, I was there for five years and here I am now. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful story. Um, and, uh, a pretty profound, uh, reminder at the way in which God's grace works, uh, in our lives to, to move us and to really take us from places where there, there seems to be no intentionality on our part. And then all of a sudden here we are. Um, so, wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was, that was beautiful. Um, so yeah, I would look I, at I, it as the Holy Spirit really active anonymously and then and then uh, in name at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, 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 the key for me was when about two years in, um, this is a very unique parish, by the way, in, in, it's St. It's Paul's Parish uh, Episcopal Church in Riverside, Illinois, which is outside Chicago. Very, very unique place. I thought it was what every Episcopal church was like. And I could talk about that. But anyway, at one, I got involved with um, the adult formation program. And my, and my rector said to me, Matthew, when was the first time that you experienced the presence of God? Hmm. And I had never once thought of that question. But I had an immediate answer, which is when I was five o'clock, five years old, listening to my grandmother play the piano and organ uh, in, in northern Wisconsin at their home, that I had had that experience that had stuck with me, the presence of, of God, um, but I'd never processed it that way. I just processed it as this weird thing that happened when I was five. Mm-hmm. And so I immediately answered, and then that just opened up all sorts of revelation to me that, that the Holy Spirit has been present in my life at least consciously since age five and so the holy spirit was at work um guiding me and 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 calling me in and so it's the and it's the holy spirit who brought me down to florida uh because we would have mm-hmm. never as upper midwesterners chosen this this humid godforsaken place in terms of the humidity i mean i like florida but the humidity is yeah. not what we like at all 
anyway. So yeah, I I can relate to that being being uh, from uh, from the Midwest can. myself. Yeah, I, living in and Illinois. Arizona, for, right. That's right. Yeah, lived in Ari- uh, Illinois almost my whole life. Northern Illinois, on right by the Wisconsin border, and then moved here to yeah. Arizona. And oh my goodness, yeah, it's oh shell goodness. shock. <laughs> Well, I, I, I want to uh, move the conversation to to kind of, uh, I, I think, a, a unfortunate controversy that exists kind of within the Anglican world. And that is, you have this idea that orthodoxy is only found in the continuing movements that have split from the mainline Episcopal Church. And yet, I have increasingly seen priests such as yourself and others who are remaining within the Episcopal Church and standing for orthodoxy, standing for the faith once for all delivered. And so I, I want to ask you, as somebody who's lived it, who has remained in the Episcopal Church, what your reason for, for doing that is and what your experience uh, in the Episcopal Church has, has been like. Well, I remain in the Episcopal Church because God has clearly indicated that's where he wants me and my family. And I have reconciled that in terms of um, standing in a witness as as an, what I say, Orthodox Catholic witness within within the Episcopal Church and within the Anglican movement more broadly, including uh, Church of England, for example. I don't, I pray for the ACNA and the, and the APA and the ACC, and I know I'm missing one there. Um, I have, I pray for them. I, I have, I have colleagues or, you know, people I know and priests and whatnot. So I, I don't think about those so much because I don't have any personal experience in those jurisdictions. So Whereas I do have obviously experience in Episcopal Church as well as I've, I've, I've been over in England a number of times and have talked at length about things matter things over in the in the C of E, so I have a little bit more experience there. So, um, so Orthodox Catholic witness from the perspective of the Episcopal Church and the C of E, but most obviously for the Episcopal Church. Um, that's I mean it's really because God has has showed that to me many times. Hmm. Um, we almost, we almost, well, we thought about, you know, leaving a couple of times, my wife and I, and, but immediately God showed us something to stay. Um, and it's, you know, you, you have to discern these sort of things between, you know, what's of God and what's of the devil. Um, having studied that a lot, uh, you know, I'm certain that it was to stay to give God glory amidst the ruins of of the Anglican world as, as far as I know it and, and can speak to it. And the Episcopal Church uh, is certainly in ruins in a lot of ways. It, um, and this, this, the Church of England appears to be some, suffering a similar situation, although they're different, of course. Um, for me, it's been, it's been overall uh, an experience of of joy, of 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 life changing, of of life improving. Um, I, I have I, I do believe very firmly that the Holy Spirit is not done with the Episcopal Church yet. Um, and uh, so you know things are things are much things are good within the parish context, I love my parish. Hmm. And this parish is a historically Orthodox Catholic parish, and that's what they want, that's what I wanted in a parish, and and being here has been fantastic. Um, I mean, it's a parish, so there's always stuff, but, you know, overall. Once you, once I go sort of outside of the parish, in the Episcopal Church, it's a, it's a spectrum of experience from acceptable to appalling. Um, I have colleagues in the, in my diocese, which I, which I enjoy, uh, the diocese I enjoy, I have colleagues I respect very much. And, um, and, um, you know, so 
Um, in the national level of the Episcopal Church is, is generally speaking an embarrassment and something I don't pay attention to on that unless I absolutely must. Um, so my attitude in general is that as bad as it is, it's not as bad as it was for Basil and Athanasius in the, <laughs> in the fourth century when it, when the whole church was Aryan. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'm serious about that. That's actually something I think about daily. Yeah. And the, and, and the courage that Basil and Gregory Nazianzus and, and Athanasius and others demonstrated in standing up to the heresies uh, of Arianism and, and, and the, the other ones, Eunomianism and whatnot. I mean, that's, that's way worse, in my opinion, than things are now in the Episcopal Church. Yeah. Yeah, I so, think a lot, of, a lot of times situations like, like the one that we're, we're in right now, and I would say just on a broader Catholic scale, there's really no part of the church that's not being affected by different heresies and different um you know so sometimes age old heresies that are popping back up into existence and i think part of the way in which we process this and understand how to deal with it is by getting that perspective and thinking less of just our immediate context as though this is all there is and taking that wide look at church history and saying like the church has been here before and sometimes much more grievous situations and she has always, by the power of Jesus Christ, come out um, defending orthodoxy stronger than she was before. Um, it is in the midst of persecution, in the midst of standing up against the powers of, of the devil, that the church is strengthened and that she uh, thrives and survives. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's helpful to look at, at some of those figures and to just say, like, hey, we need to get some perspective and look at the, the big picture. Um, and so with that being said, um, we look at some, a figure like Athanasius that stands up against Arianism and over the course of time, Arianism crumbles and falls and becomes very, a very, very small fraction of what's taking place and orthodoxy reigns. Um, so obviously, I imagine that you would say that you have a similar expectation for the current crisis in the Episcopal Church now. Do you feel as though um, orthodoxy can regain momentum in the mainline church and uh, heresy will fall? I do. When you focus on, as a priest, uh, as a parish priest, as a rector on your parish, then you can see it as something realistic. Um, you, you know, you have to start somewhere. And the parish is the primary experience uh, or the place of the, uh, the, the parish is the place, the primary place for uh, the experience of God for most people, right? So, um, you know, we're, when we, we have this problem of like, we go, I, you know, I get, you go to an Episcopal parish. Does that mean you believe in all of the stuff that gets associated with the Episcopal Church? And the answer is, if you want to know what, you know, I preach or believe in, you know, come to a mass or hear my sermons. I put them online. It gives you a pretty good idea. Um, orthodoxy will return as it, with each parish and each parish priest who acts as a good shepherd. Um, it's just like that. It's got to be a ground up, priest led movement. Um, <clears throat> priests who decide that their primary identity is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and that our um, immediate existence is not some different form of Christianity, um, but just a, an expression which is the Anglican Episcopal uh, expression of it, but that ontologically we're, we're, you know, colleagues with the upper room, the 120 apostles there, um, colleagues with the church fathers, colleagues with the desert fathers and mothers, colleagues with, with the undivided church of the first millennium. Um, and then acting that way from that, 
point of departure and that daily reality. You know, it's that ontological aspect of our participation in the One Holy Catholic Apostolic Church is the basis for the renewal of orthodoxy anywhere, and certainly within the Episcopal Church. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think, too, that there, at least in my experience, I'd be interested to get your your take on this as well, but that kind of local level approach, as opposed to going, we need to fix the hierarchy of the church. No, it's be faithful on the local level in your parish and watch as that then produces fruit from the, from the ground up. In my experience, there seems to be a growing trend, specifically within a lot of the younger generations, towards tradition, towards orthodoxy. You're seeing a lot of these liberal churches. It's really just kind of some stragglers that are that have been maybe born there, raised there, and so they're sticking around. But the churches that are being packed, churches that are being filled every single Sunday, are the ones who are preaching the Orthodox Catholic faith. Um, I have been amazed to see how many of my friends um, have moved from evangelical backgrounds or more liberal forms of Christianity into more orthodox parishes um, and it's been very encouraging to me and i i think when we take a, a this this very uh how do i want to say it this very broad approach where we just look at the hierarchy of the church or what the episcopal church is saying from the top or what the bishops are saying here it can be very discouraging because we're seeing all of this just heresy and liberalism but when you take a very local approach and you just say okay i'm going to go to my parish and and let that be a picture of the work that Christ is doing. I've been so encouraged to see the amount of people, especially young families, that are craving orthodoxy, that are pursuing orthodoxy, and that are not just attending church nominally, but are actually wanting to be involved, wanting to participate in the life of the church. Um, have you seen that as well? Has that been part of your experience? It has. Um, I, I'm a, I don't have, I see big numbers in a church. I don't necessarily think it means, you know, um, I don't necessarily think that it means, you know, everything is, you know, going along exactly as it should. I mean, I, there sure. are numbers in, in, in non-denominational churches, which would, blow us away obviously and like i don't necessarily regard that approach to following jesus as the right way to go but their numbers would say yeah look at that sure um but uh you know i the other problem with um, regarding you know what the national bishops or national church or that sort of thing the Episcopal Church as such, or the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, as the leading characteristic of the of everything associated with the word Episcopal, is that it denies, I think, that the nature of the church, which is threefold. You know, you have you have the church militant in which parishes like mine and yours and others, you know, live and breathe, the church militant. And then you have the church expectant or whatever you want to call it, the intermediate state, paradise, there's different names, purgatory, there's different names for it. Uh, the place where the faithful departed, you know, exists. Um, and then you have the church triumphant in heaven with the angels and, and those saints that have run the race. Um, you know, we're part of that one church. Right. And the church militant is named that for a reason because it's a battle. Mm. And it's a battle not only against the, the principalities and the, and the unseen forces and powers, but it's also a battle against human nature and as it lives in, as it lives out in, among people, including bishops and delegates to synods and, and things like that. Like, just because, you know, the Episcopal Church might have made a canon, you know, something which is a heterodoxy or a heresy. I tend to use heresy and heterodoxy more or less equivalently. Um, just because they do that 
doesn't necessarily mean that everything that comes under the umbrella of the word Episcopal is therefore removed from the threefold church. It just doesn't work that way. You know, if that's true, then when the church was airing in the fourth century, then Basil and Athanasius and Gregory and Andiazza should have just given up. They didn't. You know, her sometimes heterodoxies become canon law. Okay, so you work to change it over time. You know, but you, and it starts at the local level in the parish, and you yeah. just, you know, you, you 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 accept what you can change, or you so you accept what you cannot change, and you work on what you can. Mm. You know, it, it's the whole John Keeble quote, really. You know, if the Church of England collapsed, it'll be found in my parish. Yeah. You know, if if everything of Anglicanism collapses. It'll be found in my parish. I can guarantee you that. that the Orthodox Catholic faith you know, of the ecumenical councils and the creeds and the, and the 2000 year church will be found in my parish. Not, not perfectly or better than anywhere else, but it will be here. Yeah. Mm. You know, that's all I can control. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Not amen really to that. Control it, of course, the Holy Spirit does, but you know, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. How would you, because um, I think it's a tension that is difficult for a lot of people who are looking and they're seeing the errors and these these heresies breaking out in different parts of the church. They're trying to square that with the idea of the indefectibility of the church, that, that Christ's church will preserve the truth throughout all ages. How have you as a priest... Um, and maybe this is kind of more of a pastoral question on a pastoral front. How have you thought about that and um, really talked to people about how to square the amount of error that they see with this idea that the church at the end of the day is indefectible? Hmm. Well, I have been blessed in both of my cures. My first was a two church or two point cure in central Illinois, and my second is where I am now, just the one, so at one point cure. I have been blessed in both places, as well as my sending parish back in uh, outside Chicago, that these things don't really come up because um, in terms of everyday conversation in a parish, um, sometimes they do, but uh, there's this sort of general understanding or awareness that most of what, if not everything, that's coming out of the general convention of the Episcopal Church is to be ignored because it, they've lost all authority. Um, so they're just not paid attention to. The most recent general convention, I got, a, I got one parishioner asking me some questions about it. Most people aren't paying attention to it where I am. Um, I, I think the right way to think about it, if you're going to think about the church besides the parish or broader than a parish, is the diocese. We have a, a generally solid diocese. Um, we have a new bishop who is Orthodox, Justin Holcomb, um, mm -hmm. and uh, but 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 not abrasively so. Um, he's actually, I think, very very good in terms of speaking to people who might disagree with him as my as my as his predecessor uh bishop greg brewer was i think as well um but to your question it just hasn't really come up if it if it did i would i would just say look um the church has always had problems the church has always had heterodoxies and and, and heresies what we have today is nothing new if you pay close attention to it it'll drive you crazy we're not talking about any of that stuff in our parish. Our bishop is not talking about any of that stuff. So, you know, we're in a, we're in a bit of an oasis. Mm. And just just try to rest in that place, pastorally speaking, in terms of how I talk to people. Yeah. And they will say, oh, well, you know, you know, look at, they look at our, our, our liturgy, they'll look at what, you know, the things I preach about, the things that I teach about. They'll say, oh, okay, none of that stuff is what Father Dahlman is talking about. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about scripture. He's talking about doctrine, which is, you know, as old as the moon. Um, 
He's not talking anything crazy. Yeah. Only on Twitter. Haha. <laughs> so um, yeah. So that's that's the pastoral thing. It starts though in having a sane, orthodox, rooted, reverent parish. Yeah. That's good. Mm-hmm. I, I want to shift the conversation slightly uh, into more of what is Anglicanism? What is Orthodox Anglicanism? And mm. I've asked this question maybe a hundred times to a bunch of different people, and I get different answers all the time. And I think this is kind of, for some people looking into Anglicanism, this is a dilemma for them. They're like, hey, there does not seem to be a united voice on what Anglicanism is, what is orthodoxy. And I personally believe that Anglo-Catholics or those who are on the more Anglo-Catholic side of things have a more robust answer to this, which is uh, basically that we have no faith of our own. It is simply the Catholic faith that has been given to us through the creeds and ecumenical councils. Um, and I know you are more on the Catholic side of, of Anglicanism as well. And so I, I would just ask you, in your estimation, what is Orthodox Anglicanism? It's rooted in the Book of Common Prayer um, in terms of not only the, well, in terms of its liturgy. Uh, Matins, morning prayer, even song, evening prayer, every day, throughout the year, and uh, Holy Communion, Mass, Eucharist, every Sunday, as well as the uh, feast days of the year, taken very seriously, um, especially the the uh, black letter or red letter days on the calendar, such as. Um, you know, St. Andrew or St. Andrew coming up right next uh, uh, November 30th. I mean, I we Orthodox Anglicanism in being rooted in the Book of Common Prayer must pay attention to the saints, yeah, and must have a robust theology and understanding of the saints and and what their gift is to us as resonators of the Holy Spirit, as teachers of of of, of Scripture, uh, as proclaimers of the gospel that the saints matter as, as much as anybody in terms of how we receive and appropriate and live in the faith of, of Jesus Christ. I would say that would be one of the biggest problems in the Anglican world is a terrible uh, understanding of the saints. Mm. Um, anyway, also a uh, student of the church fathers, uh, I would say also student of spirituality. This is where someone like Martin Thornton really comes in profoundly in terms of how he talks about the schools of spirituality. Uh, this is a lot of this is a lot of my work in Aiken side. Um, rooted, I would say, also in the ecumenical councils, not just the seven, but the of course the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 which I think is primarily a council about that establishes uh, the necessity of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, And that's as important of an ecumenical council as any of the other seven, but they all are important. Um, I would say Orthodox Anglicanism is rooted in seven sacraments, traditionally construed, traditionally uh, received and practiced. And I would say Orthodox Anglicanism is, uh, in, in light of all of that, um, is concerned primarily about the, li- the living tradition right now and the hearts and, and souls uh, and prayer life of people right now, mm. um, rather than uh, focus on, on an undue focus on history or, or the sort of the museum aspect of Anglicanism. So I would, I would, I would, my answer, I could go on and on about this, but that would be, I think we should, we, we should aspire to the same thing that the, that the Caroline Divines aspired to 
the same thing that um, Wesley and others of that era aspired to, the same thing that um, the Oxford divines aspired to, and the same thing that people like Martin Thornton, Donald Alchin, Eric Maskell, John McQuarrie of the 20th century aspired to, which is, which is an Anglican life that is recognizable by our Orthodox and Roman brethren. Mm -hmm. Not the same. Right. Not the same, but recognizable. Uh, and um, that's, that's what we, sh that's Orthodox Anglicanism is also focused on our aspiration uh, to be fully recognizable. In other words, how our practice, our theology, um, all of it, the sacraments recognizable so that they, they w whether or not we're in communion, they can look at us and be like, okay, yeah, that looks like basically what we do. Yeah, yeah. You know, notice who I didn't mention in that. I mentioned Orthodox and I mentioned Roman. Mm -hmm. So, right, right. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I think Orthodox Anglicanism is all about. Mm. There's more things I could say though, um, if you don't mind. I I think that the orth the our Anglican tradition is has a ton of strength, starting with the Book of Common Prayer. Um, I think, however, we have and Father Martin Thornton talked about this. We have some weaknesses. And one of my controversial posts on Twitter from about six or eight months ago talked about the weaknesses, you know, and I would I would say the weaknesses include things like an understanding of, of mystery in an apophatic sense. I would say uh, a misunderstanding of icons and the theology of icons. I would say a misunderstanding of hagiography. I would say a misunderstanding, um, not not having a patristic mindset or what they call a phronema. Mm -hmm. um, I would say a misunderstanding or just mal lack of attention to the church fathers. Anglicans have always looked to the church fathers, but that's, you, know, you can see that in, 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 the, in the 16th century, even in the canons right. of the Church of England. They're insisting that preachers conform to the, to the church fathers in their theology, you know? I mean, it's not like new, it's just, I don't, I don't think we look enough at the church fathers. And when you do that, you quickly learn about and are exposed to patristic asceticism. And that has to be, uh, uh, that's part of our renewal program. And that really all comes into a, a, a simple, simple practice, which is the Jesus prayer and understanding how unbelievably profound the Jesus prayer is. And that it's a yeah. prayer of the whole church. It is not a prayer only of the Orthodox, the Eastern. It is a prayer of the whole church. It is clearly rooted in, in the New Testament. And uh, it's a prayer I pray personally countless times a day. It's, yeah. it's a prayer for everybody. So no. those are the things that I look at uh, in terms of uh, strengthening the orthodoxy of Anglicanism. Yeah, yeah, that, that's all. That's all excellent. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, especially with the the profundity of the Jesus Prayer. I, I too, um, have had a devotion to the Jesus Prayer for probably a little over a year now, with very consistent effort and. Uh, after a year, you'd think a, a short, simple prayer like that would be like, oh, yeah, I've, I feel like I'm just beginning to understand the depths and riches of it. Um, yeah. So I, I couldn't I couldn't recommend it enough. I think it is it is a way in which we can participate in a living tradition of the church and not just to commune with God, but to commune more deeply with with uh, the, ch the church of all ages, honestly. Um, and, and, and speaking to that, you talk about this, this idea of the importance of like the living tradition of the church right now uh, in the current age that we are in. And what I'd like to tie to this, because I see a connection and I, and I am curious to, to get your thoughts, is this idea of the saints. You pointed out that within Anglicanism, especially today, there seems to be 
a very, very deficient view of the saints, the role of the saints, the importance of the saints. Um, and tied into that is things like invocation, things like icons that are oftentimes just kind of thrown to the wayside. But the, the thing about the saints that's so profound to me is the fact that not only are they a part of our history where we can look into the past and say, okay, I can read somebody who wrote 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, but we can also experience the reality of the saints as a living witness right now in their lives as they live them in glory, glorified with Christ. And so there's a sense in which the past and the future and the present are all sacramentally participating in one another through Christ. And we get to enter into that. And the lives of the saints are so, is so profoundly connected to all of that. So I really want, if you don't mind, uh, I would really love if you could just double down on <laughs> pointing out the error and having a deficient view of the saints and why that absolutely has to change within the Anglican communion if we want to be recognized by the orthodox and the and the and the roman catholics um and if we want to have a robustly catholic faith um yeah i mean it, the saints are normal human beings who were transformed by the gospel they're not superhumans they are some alien species. They are everyday people who responded to the Holy Spirit and were transformed. And so their lives become, you know, themselves educational and, and demonstrative of how the gospel of Jesus Christ um, calls us into whom we've already been in the eyes of God, but have not because of sinful ways and in a sinful world and cannot achieve without God's grace and without um, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And you see in the saints, in the lives of the saints, and it's not, I'm not talking about a thousand. I'm talking about reading and getting to know the saints who have a, 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 a feast day, you know, in, and on the calendar of the, the Book of Common Prayer in bold letters, you know, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four a month, the, the, those saints. The saints of the New Testament, you get to know them. That's why the saints who wrote the New Testament books included them in the narrative so that we would get to know them through prayer i mean the, you know the doctrine of the communion of the saints from the apostles creed which i would never want to give up by the way the apostles creed it's it's not really used in the eastern world it's another of the of the good things we have in ours along in our in our tradition along with the book of common prayer mm -hmm. so the doctrine of the of the communion of the saints starts with the fact that it's saints who wrote the New Testament. And so we're already in communion with them when we're reading the Bible. Yeah. Um, you know, we're in communion with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Paul, and then Peter, right? And we're in communion with Mary, the mother of Jesus, because Luke told us so much about her. And the only, the only person that Luke got all that inf information about the infancy of Jesus was obviously from Mary. And so we're, the, the, the very scripture that we read in the New Testament is itself a, a, an activity by which we're communing with the saints. All so that we can know Jesus and, and serve him, you know. Um, I'm committed to the idea very much so that, uh, that as we study the saints, the Holy Spirit who filled them is shared with us, mm -hmm. you know, th through 
his transformation of them. Um, and the other thing I would say, and I say this a lot in my parish and in my, and in my, and in, and in my uh, preaching, you know, the communion of the saints starts with Acts chapter 1. We're told that Jesus sent the 120 apostles, give or take, to the upper room. And they were there for nine days. And Luke, in his unbelievable austerity of description, tells us so very little about what they did during those nine days. I, I, I'll say this with all reverence, criminally scant details, <laughs> nearly criminally. Um, but I think it's because he wants us to enter into the mystery of Acts 1, enter into the mystery, mystagogy, being drawn into the mystery of the upper room, because all you have to do is ask the question, over those nine days, what did they do? Yeah. We know that they were together. We know that they were together with one accord in prayer, um, which is a profoundly meaningful thing for Luke to say, if, if you pay attention to how he talks about being together with one accord in, in his writing, in prayer. Um, he, he gives a certain emphasis to the presence of Mary there. Uh, they were together in fellowship. They were, uh, it seems, doing what Jesus taught them to do on Easter, which was Christologically read the Psalms mm. and probably other scripture books such as Joel, because we hear Peter preaching about Joel and Pentecost. And they're reading these Christology. They're finding Jesus in the Old Testament, finding Jesus in the Psalms, finding the Holy Spirit. They're doing this together. So much so that they were able, it seems, to together um, get past what I would imagine would be their confusion and anger towards Judas Iscariot so as to know what to do, to elect a successor. And, uh, but I mean, gosh, that's not very much details. Right. Right. So I think when we put ourselves in the room and ask ourselves, what, what would they have done? This is where the, the communion of saints is like, well, they had saints around them. You know, how many saints were in that room? I mean, in the capital S sense. 30, I don't know. And we're told of about 12 or 14, you know, but there's more, obviously. And, and so the saints is how the church started, the communion of saints. Um, and uh, so that's, without the saints, you, won't, you don't have the church in that sense. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a deficient view uh, is seeking to sit and move in a car that has no wheels. Um, the saints are the foundation of the church through Christ, uh, the apostles. And if we fail to honor wow. them, fail to commune with them, fail to recognize them and recognize the interaction that we have through the word, through icons, through prayer, etc., then we're missing the foundation. Uh, and how, how much advancement will we then have in spiritual nourishment and growth if we leave behind the foundation? Look at it this way. There's 120 people in the upper room. Everyone is there because they want to be there. They're aware that uh, their life might be at risk because they had just lost Jesus. Yet he had found them in the resurrection numerous appearances to them to give them consolation, so much so that they're, we're told by Luke that they're in joy as they're together in the upper room. But nonetheless, Christ is ascended, but he's not materially present in the way he was. Right. In his body, I mean. So, uh, what, do, so what do you do? How do we understand the situation? How do, how do the people in that room know what to do, what to do next. How, well, they look around. 
There's St. Mm. Peter. I want to know more about what St. Peter remembers of, of time with Jesus and, what, and how he's thinking about those words that Jesus told him. Tell me, Peter, about your remembrances. I, I, they're going to look around and, and look at Mary Magdalene. Tell us, Mary Magdalene, about you know, how you moved from a woman of seven demons to being the, the, the apostle to, to the apostles the one who proclaimed the resurrection to the apostles. Tell us about, tell us, tell us about that. But I mean, even more so, they're going to look around in the room and who's known Jesus the most, but Mary, who's in that room, who's known him for 33 years, plus nine months, <laughs> starting with the Annunciation. Are you, are you honestly going to say that people aren't going to, Listen to every single syllable out of out of the Blessed Mother's mouth. They would, because she she would tell them about Jesus. So mm. th this is what it means to be in communion with the saints. Yeah, mm. and this is certainly the root of a of 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 devotion to the Blessed Mother as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I really like that. I think that that puts it into a very, a very practical, what we see today and how we practice the veneration and honor of the saints today, that puts it into a very practical form where we can see, just put yourself in that place and ask, what would you have done? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. I, I want to I want to ask your thoughts. Um, your appraisal of really the Reformation in England, as well as some of the more reformational documents that came out of that, such as the Thirty Nine Articles and the the Book of Homilies uh, or Books of Homilies, uh, as they're commonly called, and you see kind of a, a trend within Anglicanism, two ways. You have some people that throw them off entirely say it's it's not important we don't need that at all you have others that emphasize that this is the fundamental doctrine of the church of england and all anglican bodies without them we are nothing and this this is in some sense the final say um i my perspective is these are important parts of our history they represent where we came from they represent the response to certain controversies at the time but as catholics we must look beyond them to the witness of the entirety of the catholic faith um and not tie ourselves to paper popes if you will um and so I, i'd be curious to get your just appraisal of the reformation broadly um and then more specifically the english reformation and the things that came out of that Oh, well, a lot of people died. <laughs> it Indeed. was not a good time for moral life at that point in time. A lot of people were killed. Um, I remember that. I think about that more than I think about anything else in, in terms of my initial thought. Gosh, the morality that, that allowed people of, of all sides of the sort of the, the controversies in the church to just be fine with killing people is appalling. Yeah. Um, the, uh, of course, from the Anglican perspective, it's a whole, it's a whole story, you know, but um, that's complicated and, and we all know that, but, um, you know, out of it, Um, I think you see, from my perspective, first of all, the uh, inception of the Book of Common Prayer as a massively important moment in the history of the church, meaning yeah. the one holy Catholic apostolic church. I think, I think what came out of the Reformation with the, with the Book of Common Prayer, in the words of, of Martin Thornton, it is still the most brilliant document of its kind, 500 years later. Um, and we are the only tradition that has, of the, of the historic Catholic traditions, I mean, 
uh, Roman and Orthodox and the Anglican Episcopal. We are the only tradition of those three that has the Book of Common Prayer. Now, you know, we see, of course, that recently, both in the Roman and the Orthodox tradition, you have them taking up in different ways the Book of Common Prayer into their into their uh, communions, which is, a, I think, bespeaks just how brilliant the Book of Common Prayer is, and and how that's something we can always be very very thankful for. I would also say in terms of the Reformation and in terms of uh, the, the Anglican aspect of it, the, the move away, not, not, just, not just what King Henry and Henry VIII did in order to secure a, a, an annulment, but, but the reception of that, you know, 100, 200 years on where it's like, okay, yeah, we don't want to go back to communion with Rome, you know. Um, it could have happened at a couple points, perhaps most recently in the 1970s, after Paul VI gave Arthur Michael Ramsey his archiepiscopal ring mm, right. to have, along with a chalice, which, you know, is just the kind of thing a pope does when he doesn't think the person receiving them is an actual bishop. Right. I say sarcastically in my Twitter voice. Um <laughs> Like if there's not a more, if there's not a gesture that would more positively affirm Anglican orders at that point in time in history, other than a written document, I can't think of one. Anyway, um, you did have abuses by the, the medieval uh, Roman church, and we all know what they were, and, and you know, um, sacramental abuses and, and, and scriptural abuses, you could say, and, and um, you know, it was a messy time. So the move away and the reception and affirmation of that separation over time in the, in the, in the Anglican uh, communion um, has, leads me to, along with other things, to, to conclude that we've been, we Anglicans have been recognized the problems with, with the Roman church at the time and we've been trying to uh, align and as well as join with the patristic expression of the church, the one holy Catholic apostolic, which if you look around the church militant, you'd have to look to the Orthodox church for that. I am not for a moment going to say that the Caroline divines and the other reformers of, who came before them were, you know, secretly desiring to swim the Bosphorus. I don't mean that. I mean that it's been a kind of a bit of a chicken without a head type thing where, you know, uh, looking for looking for the, the kind of expression of the Christian life that intuitively Anglicans, I think, have been yearning for, um, not knowing how to get it, not knowing where to look. It's been it's been you know immersed in political turmoil every which way you look for 500 years in England, in the in the in in North America. Um, so, I would say that you know it was it was a break, uh, so as to eventually grow into uh, a tradition with a good start in the Book of Common Prayer and and the other voices of the time. The theological voices um, to, to 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 grow up, and so I, I see the the break from the Anglican perspective as as something that we're still growing into because we haven't yet realized the aspiration mm. of of being truly a you know a patristic primitive oriented church quite yet. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's very good, a very good assessment, and I think that that's. Perhaps one of my biggest uh, critiques of the more reformed uh, Anglicans, and this is, you know, no personal attack at all. I, I definitely respect them in many ways. But I think sometimes within a kind of reformational mindset, there seems to almost be this focus on a very particular era as being the pinnacle of Christianity and everything from here on out into the future is simply, you know, um, just 
trying to be faithful to this particular Reformation era in the 16th century. And I think we need to recognize that the church, the life of the church is the Holy Spirit who guides and reforms and moves us into deeper, deeper truth and conformity to Christ. And so we would be fools to think that the final word for truth was said at any point in time. We're, there, God is eternal and we can not as finite beings ever exhaust the infinite or even claim to know the infinite in any sort of absolute sense. And so there's a real sense in which the, the Semper Reformanda kind of idea is, is actually deeply uh, tied to full Catholicity, I, I would say, and, and, and seeking to grow into that, the fullness of the faith and, um, or I should say a deeper realization of it. Um, uh, what, what would you say yeah, to I that? I think so, and also a, a sense of authority. Um, so, you know, when you, when you break away from the papacy, that uproots a source of authority. Mm -hmm. and so then you have to look other places for that kind of authority, and you see that happening. I mean, yeah. you see that in the, in the fusion of church and state in England, and the authority that's now seen even in the monarchy, right? Um, you know, Charles's, uh, King Charles' uh, coronation was seen yeah. as, an, as an event of the Church of England, which it was, of course. Right. Um, and so you have authority there in that uh, establishment. In the, in the North American context, we've never had anything like that, of course, in terms of monarchy. But we've had a de facto uh, authority in uh, the, the society of, of the United States, the government, the president, you know, Episcopalians have pretty much stopped bragging about it, but they used to brag about how almost every president, you know, attended St. John's Episcopal in D.C., the one that burned um, in the riots there when, and then that President Trump stood in front of with the Bible upside down. Um, that one. Right. So we don't brag about that so much anymore, but that was a source of de facto authority as well as, you know, the whole criticism of waspiness was kind of a, a moneyed interest and political power, political people with power. The Episcopal Church has always been very close to sort of the normal society, you know, so even when um, I forget the name of the Supreme Court decision, what was the name of the decision that 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 legalized same-sex marriage was it over no what was, what was that decision oh man well Dodge whatever that was it yeah. happened during it happened during one of the episcopal general conventions right and it was just like that was almost the same thing as the english establishment right because like of, of church and state because that happening coincided almost exactly with the episcopal church you know making same-sex marriage canonically valid um and, you know, I think the Episcopal parishes have never strayed very too very far from, like, normal society around them. Mm. And so there's a source of a kind of authority there that I don't think is a good authority, but it, it's an authority. Whereas I think the sources of authority that we need to find, and not only find, but deeply establish and, and, and be grafted onto, are the, the authority of the one holy Catholic apostolic church seen in the church fathers in the ecumenical councils of the undivided church, um, in the saints, in, in, in icons. You know, and this is something that I've learned relatively recently that in the Orthodox tradition, icons have a source of, of authority and they're, they're seen as expressing, you know, doctrine. Yeah, and they're theological in orientation, you know. So they they act as a source of authority to guard against heterodoxy or heresy. Mm. Um, mm. And so uh, you know, we're looking for authority, and I think if you look at the Anglican world for the last, like even seventy five years, right, in in all in all places, not just England and North America, but everywhere else, the whole question of authority is like. You know, hugely problematic, right? You see that with Gascon right. deciding that Canterbury no longer has authority, right? You know, before that, you know, the whole movement to the Windsor, um, 
I'm sorry, the, the Anglican covenant, that's what I was trying to say, mm -hmm. trying to come up with a source of agreed upon authority among the Anglican world, but that failed, right? The, the covenant, the Anglican covenant was, did, was, was failed. I mean, you know, the questions of, is scripture the ultimate authority? Are bishops the ultimate authority? What's our ultimate authority? Right. You know, that was, that was, I think, a product. The tumultuousness of that is a product of breaking away from the papacy, which I think was a good thing to do. But we haven't quite come up with the genuine replacement yet of authority mm. that that had for, for, the, for the church in England at the time. And so we're still kind of flailing around looking for authority. And I think that's really why you have Anglicans, you know, citing the, the 39 articles, citing the homilies, um, citing um, uh, you know, the Caroline divines and giving them an authority, those things in authority, which, you know, they may or may not actually have, but it comes from an impulse to, to find authorities to, so as to have stable, stable ground to stand on. Yeah. And so from that perspective, I, that's, how, you know, I think that's understandable, um, and natural in, in, in a way. As far as the 39 articles I, and, the, and the homilies, I regard them as important historical aspects of a broader tradition that came, that started back in the apostolic age, which is the, the church in England, the church in the British, British lands, um, and that the Reformation was, a, was an era, but, but not a beginning. It's an important historical era, and everything, yeah. like, any, like all the other eras are. And so the, the products of those, the Book of Common Prayer, the 39 Articles, uh, the homilies, they have this important historical importance that will, they will always have. Um, I have never been in a situation, and I mean this experientially now, where the 39 Articles or the homilies have taken on any more significance than that. Mm -hmm. I have not seen to actively reduce their importance, I, they have never just shown up for me in that way. And I'm talking about my sending parish that God brought me to. They were not, they were not brought up. Um, I didn't get them much at Neshota House either, by the way, in my Master's of Theological Studies degree. Um, and they're, you know, the Book of Common Prayer puts them in the, the historical documents category, which is like, such a typical Anglican fudge. It's, are they important or not? Right. Well, they're historical. They're in the book. They must be important, but they're in fine print, so they're not. I mean, mm -hmm. so there's a whole question in the Episcopal Church that uh, that other traditions in the Anglican world don't necessarily have that question, you know, about the, the importance of them. But in the Episcopal Church, they have no authority. Right. Other than the historical aspect, which has a certain authority. But living today, there's no living authority in the Third Nine Articles. And that's not a controversial statement in the Episcopal Church. Yeah. You, you know, you could say that's the source of all of our problems. And I would say that's, I think, a drastic overstatement. I would blame the social revolution of the 60s uh, for most of our problems today. Yeah. That, you know, the social movement of the 60s created the woke movement it, before it was named that. And the Episcopal Church has been woke since the 1970s. Right. It's gotten worse, right. not better over time. So I, that comes from the social revolution of the 60s, primarily. It doesn't yeah. come from whether or not the, 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 the Episcopal Church, you know, took the 39 Articles seriously. It's like, come on, that is not how it unfolded, you know? Right, right. It, the whole society started to explode and change in the 1960s in the United States. I mean, that's the source of it. And we haven't figured it out yet. We haven't come to terms with it yet. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of the Episcopal Church. Yeah. It's nothing to do with the 39 Articles. Yeah. You know? So, mm. um, anyway, that's how I look at it. I know on Twitter that I, 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 I as my wife says, I like to stir the pot. And I, and I do. <laughs> yeah. But gosh, I thought people liked that kind of thing because it was entertaining. Um, but apparently it caused a, pretty much most of my followers to either to mute me it seems <laughs> I, I feel like that's a, oh, well. that's a that's a testimony to the 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 kind of uh 
spiral of of discourse that's taken place today because uh i my wife has said similar things about me you just like stirring the pot and i'm like exactly because it gets conversation going and then we get somewhere um i i had a a conversation one time over facebook where i was talking to somebody and uh they got really frustrated with something i said and ended up saying hey i want to meet in person and talk to you face to face about this so we met in person and the first thing they said is, why do you post such inflammatory things? And I said, so that what's happening right now can happen. And they went, oh, that's actually a good point. So I think we need to get back to recognizing that there's there's some use to being bl- blunt and bold uh, so that conversation can actually go somewhere. Um, if, if you have just a little bit more time, I, I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. And and one sure of I them do. is on, on this issue of, of authority. Um, I think you're right that Anglicans are kind of grasping to try to find some solid ground to stand on for some people. That's, you know, the idea of sola scriptura for others. It's okay. The 39 articles for others. It's, it's, Hey, it's the bishops. And I think the appeal to some Anglicans for a place like Rome or, or orthodoxy is they have a very simple, straightforward answer to this. For Rome, you know, our authority is the papacy, and that is our source of unity and visible jurisdictional unity as well. For the Orthodox, it's, hey, as long as we're in canonical obedience to uh, and, and jurisdictional union with one of the historic sees, your Orthodox is kind of the, the fundamental answer. And so for Anglicans, do you have an idea of what this authority should be what it is objectively is it something that we still don't know and is it possible that part of the journey is simply being catholic and showing the catholicity of our tradition so that we could seek union with a historic see at some point and and that could be a possibility what what are your thoughts yeah i think it's kind of that last part you said but there's there's nothing on the immediate horizon in terms of unity with either with any historic see yeah other than canterbury which itself is increasingly problematic um but you know that has been uh, a a source of of authority and unity um even before the lambeth conference type stuff it was seen as a as a source of unity and it's it always will be if you're an Anglican because of people like, you know, Augustine of Canterbury uh, re-evangelizing England by uh, through a chanting of a litany with his 40 monks holding up a, a cross and holding up an icon of Jesus. Hmm. So, you know, our, our tradition is, was founded on an icon being used uh in in the 500s in england um you know I, I, there's nothing on the horizon so we're we i think we have to do our own work um that's how i look at it and that that there would be some some source of historic authority through through communion you know and i mean that in the sense of jurisdictional communion mm-hmm. down the road yeah. um and i think that that's why i held up that list that i said earlier mystery icons, hagiography, chronoma, church fathers, patristic asceticism, and, and Jesus prayer, because I think all of those are means for doing our work as Book of Common Prayer Anglicans, using and in fact strengthening the, the, the role of the Book of Common Prayer in that by, by Matins and by Evensong and, and the importance of those aspects of our liturgy and the saints, which are part of our liturgy also. But... To, you know, I to throw off the waspy aspects of our recent past, um, to to throw off the 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 Christian life that is many ways indistinguishable from the now we call like pagan society around us, um, and to think deeply about the ecumenical councils, and because it was from them that we have this little thing that we say or, or, or sing every Sunday called the Nicene Creed. Mm-hmm. You know, we're living in, uh, upon the shoulders of, 
of, of the, the undivided church. So we should get to know it a lot better than we do. We know almost nothing about it. I'm talking about the average regular parishioner in our parishes. Um, and of course, there's exceptions to this, and I'm aware of it. And we're working on this in Akenside Institute to provide resources um, to make this happen. And I'm doing a lot of experiments, devout experiments. That's a term from Martin Thornton, devout experimentalism. Um, to, to, to convey, you know, uh, the wisdom and the experience and just knowledge of the undivided church to our people. I mean, we don't need to be in communion with, with Rome and, and any of the Eastern churches to right now begin to convey to our people, you know, the wisdom, the grace of the undivided church and, and from which we get everything except, yeah. you know, like the specific words of the Book of Common Prayer, right? I mean, but but the idea of the Book of Common Prayer is is, is ancient. You know, it comes out of the rule of Saint Benedict and and other monastic rules, and so we need to do our work. Yeah, we need to challenge our people a little bit. We need to say, you know, this this is we got to give them nutrition, a nutritional diet of the fathers and and of, in my opinion, icons and and asceticism and the Jesus prayer. I mean, and we can borrow from, from the Orthodox world for, for some of their teaching literature. We can borrow from the Roman world if, if there's anything there. Um, but just let's do our work. And I think the Holy Spirit and God will see this and then he will make the kind of um, reunification that he has in mind happen. Yeah. Right now, we're, we have this great riches uh, uh, available to us that are that are mostly completely untapped. Yeah, hmm. yeah, that's that's so true. That's so true, and I hope that that serves as a as a an urge to those watching, both lay ministers as well as clergy that. We have not done a good job, and we need to do better. <laughs> we really do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I want to ask you uh, one more. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you know, in talking with my mentor at St. Paul's Riverside outside Chicago, who ended up being the rector there for 42 years, wow. his father was right a good. bishop, and he was a bishop in, in the 70s and retired in the 80s as a bishop of North Carolina, Thomas Frazier was the bishop's name, and his son was Thomas Frazier Jr. He was my mentor. Um, I knew him, well, I still know him. I was in his parish for seven years, and we had deep conversations about these sorts of things that you and I are talking about. Um, and his perspective was enlightening at every turn. I mean, the culture war of the 1960s really messed up the church, of the, of the Episcopal church of that era. And, you know, um, they weren't prepared for it, and and, the, and the, even in England, like the the um, the whole John Robinson controversy that, that Arthur Michael Ramsey had to deal with, he admitted afterwards he wasn't ready for it. Something happened at that time that just the church wasn't ready for it. Yeah, I think it's the same way now when the church isn't ready for all the woke stuff that is everywhere. But anyway, um, the idea of of deep catechesis. At that time, in the, in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, in the Episcopal Church, it was hard to do from the point of view of a parish priest when you have a heart, when you're just trying to hold the parish together because everyone's arguing about same sex marriage and women's ordination. And, you know, throw on top of that, you know, a brand new prayer book, which not a lot of people liked in 1979, messed everybody up. You know, so, you know, just trying to, to, Stop arguing with everybody right now um, would be a great help. And I think that's happened in a lot of places. That has to continue so that we can just focus on what's most important, which is the cure of souls from the point of view of the priesthood and, um, and start to tap into all these resources that we have, the, the treasury of, of resources from the undivided church, as well as, of course, the early you know, the early Anglican resources as well. Right. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think I kind of have this well, idea of, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it means anything, but lately I've been toying with this idea of a, of being a post-denominational Anglican. 
Hmm. I don't know what that means. It doesn't mean not being in a jurisdiction because you have to be in a jurisdiction. But like post-denominational Anglican where like, you know, the Anglicans from different jurisdictions can can have common cause. And, and, and you know, when they find out I'm an Episcopal priest, not throw me to the, the, the side automatically yeah. as, as I've seen happen. You know? Right. Anyway, go, right. go ahead. I, you, you were going to say something. Yeah, no, I, I, I was just going to say that I think one of one of the things that I have implemented in my life and is very deeply integrated into the missionary society that I'm I'm vowed in and pursuing ordination through is is this idea that and, and a lot of it is drawing from the east uh but it's the idea that you know faith is not something that is all right here it's not this intellectual endeavor it's something that's lived it's something that's practiced it's something that's visible and seen um in action and so i i think i think one of the ways and and you were you were touching on this i think one of the ways that we as anglicans can be authentically faithfully anglican is by spending less time in back and forth about doctrine about what document has authority and more and more time living the theology and the practice of the ancient undivided church actually living it going to mass on sunday living that receiving the sacraments uh acts of service within our community opening our homes, uh, uh, feeding the poor, d doing the things that the church has done. Um, and I think the less that we emphasize, okay, which document, which doctrine, which place are we drawing from? And the more that we emphasize living, <laughs> the, the sooner that we'll be able to start to find what it means to be authentically Anglican. Because that, that, that living aspect is the Holy Spirit in us, the, the way we live the Christian faith is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is also by the Holy Spirit that the church is one, that the church becomes jurisdictionally united. And so I think the more that we emphasize that, the better. Um, do you have anything to say on that? I think that's beautifully said, Jonah. And, um, and I say to that, amen. And um, this reminded me while you were speaking of one of the teachings of, of Martin Thornton. Um, and it's one of the many teachings of his that I don't think has been received uh, in a wide, in, widely anyway. Um, and it had to do with authority. And it, it, it was about, he said that the, 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 primary source of authority is the living church. Now right. that's easy to misunderstand. Um, by that he means a genuinely worshiping community, meaning in the prayer book context, committed to the morning prayer, evening prayer, Eucharist according to the calendar, but even more so that the priest um, has what he calls or, or, or implements what he calls a, a faithful remnant approach to priestly ministry, which is a big subject of, of his writing, particularly in the book Pastoral Theology, the, the sort of uh, model of the priesthood of, based on the faithful remnant, and that um, that is the source of authority because it is through the genuinely faithful remnant that, that God acts um, and the Holy Spirit breathes. Um, and again, this all presumes a complete embrace of the Book of Common Prayer. It all presumes a complete embrace of Holy Scripture. It all presumes um, a priest who is, is guiding souls in spiritual direction, um, a priest himself who is a student of the Holy Spirit, Right, it's a high expectation, and what he, it's a high parochial theology, which is something Father Thornton coined the term parochial theology, um, and it's a high one. He's, you know, you speak of high Christology or high sacramental theology, a high parochial theology where the 
the parish is genuinely the arena of God's theophany. Mm. Um, and so uh, that that is where authority comes, not for, you know, like, let's start having pajama mass on Sundays. I don't mean that kind of authority to make that, but movements of the Holy Spirit that we know are of God, right? Um, as he is calling us in our locality. Um, so we need to, we need in our parishes to seek that kind of, that kind of parish life, embracing the Book of Common Prayer, um, compl- embla- embracing, sc- learning how to read Scripture Christologically. Yeah. Um, you know, learning how to what, what Father Thornton calls the threefold regular office, mass, and personal devotion. Right, all of this is the, at the heart of what it means to be Anglican. Because it's at the heart of what the Book of Common Prayer fosters and orchestrates and orders is the threefold regula, or what's called also the rule of the church, which originates scripturally in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. You know, the, the, they continued in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, which is personal mm-hmm. devotion, in the breaking of bread, which is the mass, and in the prayers, which is the daily offices, as construed very early by Caroline Devines, that that refers to the morning prayer and evening prayer. So that is where I think uh, the authority locally finds its manifestation because it's an authority in the Holy Spirit as he is revealed and as he reveals Jesus Christ through the breaking of bread and the opening of scripture. Mm. Right? That's our authority, right? Um, yes. We have jurisdictional authority that we must pay attention to, of course. But, you know, the living, breathing uh, tradition of the church, that's where that's that's where it comes from, is that life. Hmm. So, yeah, that's beautiful. That uh, was very beautifully stated. I, I have two more questions for you. One is kind of a controversial one and then one's a little bit more fun. So the, the, the final kind of controversial question is uh, on Twitter. You, you, you tend to be inflammatory, as we talked about, uh, and I appreciate it, but some people don't. You, you stated uh, quite, quite bluntly that uh, you regard the confession of sola fide as, uh, quote, heresy. And that did not sit well with a lot of more Protestant-minded people. And I, I would just be curious to uh, have you kind of expand on that and expound on why you... Uh, you would regard sola fide to be a dangerous uh, teaching uh, in the church. Yeah, I just want to again say that with heresy, I basically mean heterodoxy. I, I don't mean let's throw you in the ecclesial jail. Right. Um, but uh, I was quoting, by the way, that or I was just sort of on that in that Twitter moment. I was um, in effect echoing something tweeted by Jonathan Pajot who I have respect for. Yes. He was talking about how, uh, you know, the, the Protestant idea of, of uh, faith alone, justification by faith alone, he called a heresy from the Orthodox perspective. He clarified it later as he means that in the sense of heterodoxy. Anyway, so that's what I was doing there. And I was, um, so, I mean, you know, uh, this is a fight. Uh, this is a battle. I mean, among uh, theological disagreement among Anglicans for for a while. Um, I, I mean, look. I I basically you know, rest with um, with James on this. Saint James, whom I regard not only uh, you know the apostle who wrote the epistle attributed to him, but this is James, the brother of the Lord, um, whose father was Joseph. St. Joseph, you know, Jesus's guardian, um, you know, a brother of, from a different mother, so to speak, of Jesus. And, you know, when, when, when James talks about uh, that it's, it's not through, um, you know, it, it's, it's works with faith, you know, that our justification comes and not, any, and, and not faith alone, as he says, actually, Right. I'm, I'm, I rest there. Um, the problem, though, is that uh, um, 
faith and works are both ambiguous terms in the New Testament. You know, you know. So Paul will talk about how um, in in, uh, in Ephesians, right? Uh, that um, you've been saved through faith; it's not your own doing; it's the gift of God, not because of works. Well, I'm with the view that that refers to works of the law. Right. But that's not what James is referring to when he uses the term works. Right. I'm, I, I understand James to be talking about what Paul says el elsewhere, which is that, you know, faith through, through love, works of love or works of obedience. So, so faith, so that's, so that's works, right? It's ambiguous. Are you talking about works of the law or are you talking about, you know, works of mercy? Um, well, if it's one, then it's, then you, if it, if it's, if it's by the law, if, if, if works by works of the law, then yeah, we're justified by faith alone and not works of the law. But if it referring to works of mercy, then no, that's part of it, according to James. But even faith has, has, an, ambig has an ambiguity to it. Some people think faith is about your choice, you know, to, to be faithful. So, but I'm with the view that faith is a gift of God. It's what's called in the, the ascetical uh, theology literature uh, an infused virtue, infused mm -hmm. by God. We, it's, faith is given to us by God. So it's not a choice. It's a gift of God. Right. Well, which one are you talking about there in terms of faith alone? Because if it's if it's if it's uh, you know faith in the sense of of choice, well, obviously we have to believe in Christ, right? But if it's a faith in terms of infused gift, which I think it is, that's my that's my, that's why I fall on that infused virtue, then it has to be responded to by. Works of love, works of mercy, or even just cooperation, like, you know, like we see, uh, you know, Mary saying yes at, at the Annunciation. Right. So there's an ambiguity to those words also, which, but I mean, you know, I was being provocative. I was trying to stir it up. And I think, but I did so, you know, you know, with, with, with James in my corner, so you can't just... You, People can't, I don't think, legitimately respond and say, oh, well, let's throw him to the heretic bin. Right. There was some dude who tagged my bishop and saying, are you going to allow this heretic in your diocese? He didn't say that exactly, but that's basically what he was saying. Right. I mean, like, what the heck, man? Did you, have you not read James? Right? Um, right. So... Yeah. And, so and I, I just I, sort of, I settle, with, I settle with faith and works because James did, because I'm not talking about works of the law. I'm talking about, work, you know, works of mercy and, and, right. and, and overall response to the infused virtue of faith. Right. That's, that's where I am. Yeah. I was just going to say, too, I think that when you read the English reformers, you see an implicit acknowledgement of what it is you're saying about these distinctions and ambiguity. It's what causes Cranmer to write something like lively faith. Well, why are you clarifying that it has to be a lively faith to justify? Well, because he's acknowledging that there's an aspect to this that's an infused virtue that has to be formed by love. Um, and so even within their own writings, wow. there's an acknowledgement that there's an ambiguity to these terms that needs further clarification. And once you do that, I think the theology you're talking about comes, comes out very, very clearly from the text. I think it's the only way to reconcile St. Paul and, and St. James. Um, so, yeah, I yeah. agree. And, and like, let's not hate each other because of this. My goodness, Amen. let's not dox people. I mean, let's not scream and, and quote tweet to get attention and praise i mean my goodness right yeah, yeah anyway yeah yeah definitely I mean, that's agreed. why i shut down my twitter for about 12 hours because i'm like is this what i want to devote my time to yeah. i decided that god wanted me to come back so i did but yeah you know. well 
Anyway. Many of us were, were very grateful to see see your return. We, we were worried. We missed you. <laughs> uh, the, the last question I want to ask is just a, a fun question I like to ask most of my guests that I have on, and that's in, in the broad span of church history, uh, the many fathers and doctors of the church, who have you found to be uh, formative in, in your theological journey and, and in some sense, I guess, uh, your spiritual fathers in the, in the history of the church? Yeah, awesome. Great question. Um, uh, I would I would say uh, Saint Irenaeus, particularly his Against Heresies. I love the John Keeble translation of that, which is available mm-hmm. through the Shota House Press. Um, Saint Saint uh, Saint Basil the Great, the Cappadocians in general, Saint Basil the Great, and. Uh, Saint Gregory the uh, or Nazianzus or the the one the uh, uh, theologian um, as he's called in the East. Um, I, I think I think Thomas Cranmer is a is a, is in the tradition of Saint Basil the Great mm-hmm. in terms of being an ascetical reformer. Mm-hmm. Um, Origen, he's problematic at times, but bro, I know you know this, but like I say, bro, just because I say dude. Um, <laughs> dude, he is so amazing. Even, you know, I mean, oh my goodness, his commentary on John, shut up. I mean, yep. it's, and so many other places. I mean, or, and, and Anglicans have been reading origin for a while now. For a long time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Basil and, and Gregory, the Nazianzus put together a, a philokalia, uh, philokalia is how it's say, but in Aikenside, we have this joke. We sort of say it with a so- Southern philokalia. <laughs> um, of origin, you know, that's certainly people should start there with, because they edited out some of origins, you know, nutty stuff and, and kept the, you know, the baby without, you know, it got rid of the bathwater. Hmm. Um, uh, gosh, uh, Bede, Venerable St. Bede, uh, people got to read his uh, commentary in the Song of Songs. Oh my gosh. But so many other things hmm. too his homilies. Gregory the Great, same thing. I, man, his commentary on on Job is like, as uh, as Guy Fieri would say, off the hook, man. I mean, gosh. So many things with Gregory the Great. Ignatius of Antioch. Yep. Um, and uh, the Philokalia, as I said earlier, um, or alluded to, I mean, by that I mean the now I mean the the uh, collection of spiritual texts, uh, five volumes I think now. Um, there is a uh, just briefly on that. There is an essential uh, teacher about the Philokalia right now. His name is Father Maximus Constus. He's yes, a, excellent. Uh, former yeah. former Athenite monk um, and now professor at Holy Cross Orthodox Seminary in Brookline, Massachusetts, and. He's got a bunch of stuff on, on patristic nectar that you can listen to that. Uh, and I know you have a, a fondness for Father Trenum. Um, yeah. And uh, anyway, he has a book coming out on how to read the Philokalia. There's a, there's a sort of t- tradition within the tradition. You can see it a little bit in the way of the pilgrim, that, that book on the Jesus prayer, that sort of in first first ways to first text to read to get yourself into the philokalia you're not supposed to just read them you know cover to cover it, it, it's hard to do it's a, it's very hard to do but there's actually a sequence of text in a, you know by certain authors in, in a certain order i have it on the Aikenside website um under our, our readings hmm. um i did that man and man it, the philo the, the philokalia just opened up in a, an incredible way so all of the church fathers that are there including then Maximus the Confessor, who is my recent, um, through Father Constance's help, because he has a teaching series on the Patristic Nectar website on, on Max, Maximus the Confessor. My goodness, he is incredible. And um, so, yeah, I, I have a, you know, lots to read in terms of the Church Fathers. And, and they're just amazing because they show up in my sermons all the time without me even realizing it, or sometimes I do. Um, and uh, I, I can't imagine not reading the church fathers. Mm. Just can't even imagine yeah. it right now. Yeah. As an Anglican, 
as a, as a priest committed to the Book of Common Prayer, I can't imagine not reading the Fathers. Yeah. So. Hmm. Well, wonderful. This uh, truly, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I've enjoyed every second of it, and uh, I pray others will as well. Uh, before I let you go, would you mind just if people want to find your stuff, know where they can follow you, and all that? Let them know where where to where to go. Yeah, well, uh, uh, AkinsideInstitute dot org uh, is where is 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 my baby. It's it's. Um, there's some things there. Um, it shows also what I've been doing for the last three years, or, or it, 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 it alludes to what I've been doing. I've been leading these priest cohort study groups about the Martin Thornton and his and his parochial theology. Um, anyway, AkinsideInstitute.org. I, I, I write a substack. It's uh, FRMC Dolman at substack. I'm on Twitter at the same handle, FRMC Dolman on Twitter. Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, FR Matthew C. Dolman, I think. So those are some places you can find me. Also, come visit me at my when you're in Florida, uh, south of Daytona Beach, New Smyrna Beach, my parish. Um, I'm here every Sunday. Awesome. <laughs> and days in between. <laughs> so. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on being willing to dedicate some of your time to, to having a conversation with me this was a, a blast and i hope we can do it again sometime thank you very much father oh I'd, I'd love to jonah and thank you so very much and this has been a great time and a great conversation thank you so much for having me on